before I uh, introduce Dr. Olapati, uh, I, I just want to call your attention to, uh, to next quarter. Uh, today's session will be the last uh, session in the disparity seminar for the current quarter. Um, and next quarter, we will be starting not on March 30th, as the schedule says, because there's been a cancellation from Dr. Laxmaranian in Washington. He, he was called out of the country um, for the March 30th date. Um, we're going to be starting uh, with Richard Epstein uh, on April 6, who will give a provocative talk on the case on, on the case the case for health disparities. Uh, we're all interested in that. Uh, the following week, uh, Anne Beal, who is the president of the Aetna Foundation in Connecticut, will be speaking about future directions for health equity. And David Meltzer uh, and Vanessa Gamble from Washington will be in subsequent weeks. Uh, it, it's a great quarter coming up uh, after um, uh, to, to complete the year-long series. I just uh, mentioned that the March 30th session will not take place. Um, we're delighted that Dr. Shola Olapati uh, is able to join us today uh, uh, to speak to us about indoor pollution from biomass, a global health disparities challenge. Uh, as many of you know, Dr. Olapati um, was vigorously recruited about a year, two years ago, from the University of Illinois um, to join us as a professor of medicine and as the clinical director of the Global Health Initiative at the university. Uh, Dr. Olapati is a skilled clinical pulmonologist with research interests in asthma, COPD, and sarcoid. Um, his current work in asthma focuses on the relationship between environmental and genetic factors and their effect on the expression of asthma, particularly in developing country settings, such as uh, Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Olapati is uh, well published in the pulmonary field. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Chest Physicians, and he currently is the governor for the state of Illinois for the American College of Chest Physicians. Um, he's won many awards. And uh, it's really a delight to welcome Shola uh, as a colleague, uh, as a friend, and as today's speaker. Shola. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> yeah, I want to uh, uh, thank Mark for um, allowing me to uh, participate in this uh, seminar. It's, uh, it's a different look from, uh, from this side. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do is um, walk you through some of um, what I've had the uh, opportunity of learning over the, over the years in the area of um, uh, disparity, but with a global uh, uh, twist to it. I've had the opportunity of using asthma as a model to look at uh, uh, disparities in care um, here in uh, Chicago. And um, I've always been uh, fascinated by some of, um, uh, some of um, what is known and unknown related to, uh, to asthma. And um, there is this concept of uh, hygiene hypothesis uh, that presupposes that, you know, if you see here, look at um, young uh, people who grow up in developed uh, part of the world. Uh, you don't have any exposures to any uh, infections anymore. Everybody is immunized. All the uh, sidewalks are paved, so there's very limited exposure to dirt. Uh, if you look on the other side, you see all these uh, uh, children. Uh, they have a good load of infection with uh, helminthic infection. They're always walking around in bare feet. And, uh, and uh, these uh, uh, seemingly innocuous uh, 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 differences in terms of how people live have it has significant impl implication in terms of how the immune system actually develops and works. And uh, if this is very true, it means that, you know, the immune system for the children in the developed part of the world has nothing to do. You, ca you can't find infections. You can't fight infections because they're almost gone. We give antibiotics very uh, 
um, uh, easily. So most of the immune system is twisted towards allergy. Okay. On the other side, if you live in a developed uh, part of the world, the immune system has to be primed up to fight all those parasitic infections and has little or no time to, to even think about allergy. So there was a paper this week about... In Boston. New England, exactly. The German experience is a little different, but it's along the same line. So I've always been intrigued by, is it the access to uh, care? Is it the biology or is it the environment or the interaction that actually uh, determines how asthma is uh, expressed? Uh, this is interesting because I, you know, when I see all these young people, uh, most of them uh, look like uh, a lot of my children and, you know, people in, uh, in Africa. When you look at where research is actually done, um, you know, there are 45 countries in Africa. People usually go to South Africa. You go to maybe Brazil in South America, and then that's it. Uh, so there's really not enough information to, that makes it very clear that people have actually researched and in, uh, uh, recruited people uh, to inform whether this is uh, actually true. Uh, so this was uh, my entree into uh, going to Nigeria. Oh, did I move this? Uh, so I went to Nigeria to look at this interaction in some of the rural uh, communities and to my uh, surprise about 60% of those households actually use uh, firewood indoor, so there was a lot of indoor pollution from biomass. Uh, so that, um, um, that the, the light fli flickered in my head in terms of, you know, you have all this TH1, TH1 paradigm. Nobody has really gone to Africa to look at how people live in their environment. So I decided I was going to look at that. And then about um, two, shortly after I got here, about 18 months ago, I, took, um, I went on a trip with uh, Habib Hassan, who has a cohort in uh, Bangladesh, looking at uh, the problem of um, uh, arsenic poisoning in water, and uh, wanted me to uh, help look at the pulmonary implications of, uh, in that population. As it turns out, about 80 to 90 percent of people in uh, the rural Bangladesh area also use indoor, um, uh, uh, use biofuels for, for cooking. So terribly exposed to uh, indoor pollution uh, from biomass. Uh, so the two of us decided we were going to uh, combine, do a south-south uh, collaboration because uh, I know Nigeria, I know the rural area, he knows Bangladesh to try and uh, shine, some, uh, shine some attention on the uh, issue of uh, indoor pollution from biomass, which uh, I hope by the time I'm, I'm done, you realize how uh, very little is known or even publicized about uh, the dangers of indoor uh, pollution. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is, um, you know, give you an overview of energy poverty, because uh, that's, uh, in essence, uh, what drives people to use anything they can uh, get their hands on uh, to, uh, to cook and also to for their energy needs. Um, I'll discuss, uh, you know, biomass fuel use and its impact on health and the global burden of uh, disease because it's very, very huge. And, and I'll also uh, discuss uh, some of our ongoing uh, field work uh, through the South-South uh, Collaborative between uh, Habib and myself, looking at Bangladesh and some of the rural uh, settings uh, in Nigeria, and then explore other sustainable options and uh, which may have implications for the Millennium Develop uh, Goals uh, 4 and 5, which address uh, maternal mortality and um, uh, death of, uh, of, of children. Uh, when you look at um, globally in terms of uh, access to uh, electricity, uh, most of us may, I mean, we take it for granted. You, flip, you flick uh, the switch and the light comes on. Uh, this is a true picture of uh, Places in the world where, this is taken from the uh, 2008, places uh, where there is actually no access to electricity. And I'll point your attention to areas here. It means that more than 90% of, of these places don't have access to electricity. And uh, here is uh, Niger Republic, just 
north of Nigeria. Uh, this is the Chad Republic. Uh, this is the uh, Central African Republic. And uh, my geography, this is uh, Burkina Faso. So in these places, they don't really have uh, a choice. There's no electricity. And uh, even if you look at places like this in Nigeria, one, one, one thing that should be striking to you is that most of the places where there is lack of uh, energy, or what I call energy poverty, they're clustered into Africa um, uh, and uh, maybe uh, somewhere in Bangladesh. And uh, if you look at areas that have this little halo, these are the least developed countries in the world. And there are 50 of them, 40 of them 45 of them are in, uh, in Africa. I mean, I mean, 33 of them are in Africa. So you are looking at uh, you know, a global burden of, uh, I mean, glo uh, global lack of access to energy. And I'll show you the help. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, so you can see where the, uh, and you, you look at South Africa. That's why when you talk about Africa and look, doing studies, I mean, Africa, if you've been to uh, South Africa, you realize that it's a very developed, except you are going to the neighborhoods. You know, where you, it's like transitioning from a developed to a developing country. Is that Ghana? I'm, I'm, I'm West African this country. is Ghana here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Ghana here. So Ghana is uh, doing very well. Nigeria, you know, still have challenges in terms of uh, not having access to electricity. And this is a nice cartoon that I actually love because it shows you what, uh, this is what it looks like at night. In some of this, uh, this is Africa, it's always dark at night. I, I don't know how to bring the other one where you see, uh, you know, at night, the picture, uh, so that it's, it's very, very uh, striking. Yeah, you can see, you can see that developed countries, you can see that, and then Africa is just dark. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and then um, uh, you look at, um, you know, in transitioning from uh, the impact of this lack of um, uh, energy, uh, th this is a very striking um, slide that helps me put things in perspective sometimes in terms of some of the inequities and the disparity. It just shows uh, life uh, expectancy over the years um, uh, as a reflection of the um, wealth of some of these co of, of countries. And uh, I wanted to pay attention to this 1900 um, uh, curve. This is 1930, 1960. And this is 1990. And uh, if you look at life expectancy, you can see that it's really gone up over, over time. If you look at a lot of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, places like Botswana, uh, places like uh, Malawi, life expectancy is like 30 or 35 years, even, you know, still stuck at the 1900s. Especially as uh, the advent of uh, electricity development as made life expectancy very, very generous in developed parts of the world. Uh, so when you look at it in terms of proportions of uh, um, uh, people who really uh, lack electricity in developing countries, you can see where most of them are uh, clustered. Uh, India, maybe about 28% of them. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about uh, 30%. Um, uh, in um, um, uh, India, you can see 28%. East uh, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, Arab states, uh, China maybe about one percent, and then when you, within some of those uh, developing countries, you can also look at uh, the differences between the urban and the rural settings. And if you look at the rural areas, almost ninety percent of them don't really have access to um, uh, any uh, energy or electricity, and. It, it shouldn't surprise anybody that if you don't have access to electricity, you need some form of fuel for energy, for cooking needs. Uh, so this is uh, just showing uh, uh, the distribution of people who rely on solid fuels, uh, you know, to maintain their cooking and energy needs. And you can see that, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, 21 percent, India, 27 percent, China, 21 uh, percent. And this has significant health uh, uh, implications, that I'll, as I'll show you uh, in a moment. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, global reliance on solid fuel uh, for energy needs, uh, there are about two, almost three billion people in the world 
who don't have access to electricity and have to use bio, biomass fuel for their uh, energy needs. And again, most of them are, are clustered in, um, if you look at least developed countries and sub-Saharan Africa, they're almost interchangeable. So a lot of people. And when you look at, uh, oh, what happened to this one? Oh, this one did. This was uh, just to, this slide, I don't know. It's just to show you what the uh, energy ladder looks like when you look at the, uh, the least developed countries, the developing countries, and, how, and what people use. In the least developed countries, they use agricultural waste and mostly dung. Okay? Uh, this is excreta from cow, you know, and that's what they used to cook. If you look at some of the uh, um, uh, low-income countries, they use dung, um, uh, agricultural residues, and then firewood. And then if you look at the middle-income country, um, they use all kinds of stuff, uh, from um, uh, having access to electricity, liquefied uh, uh, gas. And the developed countries, we don't, we don't really do any of that anymore. This was a picture that I actually took um, you know, when I went to Bangladesh almost two years ago. What you see on the trunk of this uh, tree is uh, excreta from the, from the cow. This is dung. And what they do is they put it on the trunk of the tree so that it dries up and it becomes um, a cake. So that when they want to cook, they just throw it in there. And uh, it's, uh, it's the most unclean um, uh, combustion you can ever get. And uh, when you, as, as I go along, I'll show you some of uh, why it has uh, unbelievable health uh, uh, implications. And uh, some of them actually get very, very creative because what you see here are, you know, sticks that, uh, and, uh, that people have to go into the bush to get, uh, you know, these little tricks, uh, I mean, twigs uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the forest. Uh, some of the kids uh, usually have this chore. And uh, what you see is uh, the sticks actually coated with dung so that you can have both dung and firewood together when you want to cook. And, um, you know, the rest is, uh, I leave up to your imagination in terms of some of the combustion when you have uh, such unclean uh, fuel uh, to cook with, and especially in a closed environment. And you can see some of the other uh, 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 stuff that people used to, to cook. This is the house of... Uh, a relatively wealthy guy in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, you can see he's got his own uh, stack of uh, agricultural hay and agricultural residue. He has about four heads of cow. And this is very interesting because at the back of his house, he actually has a pit where uh, the cow dung, you know, is actually deposited. And uh, they add water to it, and there's a connection of tube that goes back to the back of his house where methane gas actually powers his uh, customized stove. But to be able to actually have meth methane gas, enough methane gas produced, you need to have at least six heads of cow. So this is a rich guy, and you know, just think about the implications of the methane gas on the environment. But this is a rich guy in, um, in, in Bangladesh, and uh, he still has um, uh, no access to electricity. So breaking it down, you can see that in terms of the proportion of the bio, biomass fuel that people use, uh, most uh, of the time, almost 70%, I'm focusing on sub-Saharan Africa and developed countries in, in general, you can see that almost 70% use firewood, uh, about uh, uh, 10 or 11% use kerosene, um, uh, uh, and about, you know, maybe... Uh, uh, less uh, uh, often, uh, uh, in least developed countries, they don't use coal. Coal use is predominantly uh, used in China, and it has its own uh, implications in terms of uh, predisposition to developing uh, lung cancer. Uh, so when you look at the 10 leading uh, causes, uh, risk factors for uh, death in the whole world, uh, what I want to do is just bring your attention to the fact that Exposure to indoor pollution from biomass is responsible for over 2 million deaths every year. And it accounts for 3.3% of the global burden of disease. That's a big one. And this is looking at uh, the, the, uh, the global picture. When you look at uh, risk factors for death in um, 
uh, by low-income countries, you can see that it's no more number 10. It's actually about six. And uh, it causes about 1.3 million deaths every year. And uh, Nigeria and Bangladesh happen to be two of 11 countries that contribute the most to this uh, uh, mortality. So I think our South-South uh, collaboration uh, is uh, right on in terms of uh, uh, being in the right field to do this uh, study. Uh, this is just uh, a slide that pulls the risk factor, all environmental risk factors together from uh, lead exposure, climate change, indoor pollution, unsafe water, um, uh, and sanitation and problems with hygiene. Uh, you can see again that indoor pollution from uh, exposure to indoor smoke uh, from biomass fuel is responsible for most of the uh, mortality and also for this, a lot of the disability adjusted life years. Uh, so the implications of exposure uh, to indoor biomass from the health perspective, it's just unbelievable. Uh, not even to touch on the, um, uh, uh, if its effect on the climate and um, uh, degradation, because you have to go and cut down the trees, you know, to get, that's all, these poor people, that's all they have access to. Uh, so there are no other alternatives for them for, energy uh, needs. Uh, in focusing on some of the uh, most likely, uh, most common cause of mortality, uh, you have uh, pneumonia, you have obstructive lung disease, especially emphysema, and lung cancer, especially in uh, settings where they use a lot more coal. And what I want you to put in perspective is that most of the women in this, uh, most of the COPD uh, that's related to uh, indoor pollution from biomass they actually occur in women who don't smoke. And uh, the, exposure f uh, uh, the exposure to indoor pollution from biomass, biomass translates maybe to about 60 to 70 per year history of smoking. Uh, so you have a very high uh, incidence of emphysema in women uh, who have never smoked. And a lot of uh, children die of pneumonia and uh, a lot of the mortality that you see in the children is actually in children less than five years of age. And it accounts for about 30% of the 1.3 million deaths every year. Uh, so, and you'll, you'll see why this is uh, uh, the case. So in terms of the scope, you can see that three billion people, mostly women and children, because the men are usually not in their homes. They're usually out, you know, looking uh, for food and stuff to take care of their uh, of their family. And as I mentioned earlier, it accounts for uh, two point, almost 3% uh, of the global burden of disease and uh, contributes to uh, degradation of the uh, environment. So the question is, why is the exposure to indoor air pollution so dangerous to women and children? Uh, I just mentioned uh, shortly that yes, uh, because they're in there all the time. And uh, because the, uh, uh, the products of the incomplete uh, combustion of this uh, uh, fuel leads to elaboration of a lot of particulate matter in different sizes. If you're uh, looking at the most respirable uh, component of them, which is about 2.5 uh, micron, or uh, even the, uh, the, uh, uh, the PM10. You also have exposure to a lot of volatile organic acids, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are carcinogens, are oxides of sulfur, nitrogen, and name it, and then carbon monoxide and uh, trace metals, heavy metals. Uh, so you can imagine when you inhale that, uh, the kind of damage that goes on in the lung, and that probably drives the pneumonia and the high mortality in children, and also the emphysema and the uh, cancer that you see in women. I think the picture says uh, a lot. I mean, these are pictures from, uh, from Nigeria. I'll show you some from Bangladesh, but it's the same story. Uh, usually when the women are cooking, they keep their children on the back, especially when they're still little. It helps um, uh, keep them warm. You can see this little guy is just there. And you can see that uh, the intimate exposure to, the, uh, uh, to all these toxic uh, pollutants from biomass use um, uh, it's a constant picture. And you can see the walls, and uh, these are usually, the cooking sometimes is done indoors without any chimneys, without any windows. Uh, so you have unbelievable uh, uh, exposure. These are pictures that I took in, in Bangladesh. So the, the face of the poor people who don't have 
energy uh, uh, is the same anywhere in the world. And they usually have their children with them or are intimately exposed to... Uh, uh, this lady was cooking happily, uh, you know, when I took this picture. You can see um, uh, why, uh, you know, the health implications of exposure to biomass is so, so, so bad. So what uh, we decided we were going to do um, uh, twofold, to try and figure out um, uh, mechanistically why, why does this happen, and we decided we were going to look at the, um, um, uh, uh, the protective effect of uh, antioxidants, because you see a lot of uh, potential for free radical injury. And uh, mind you, these are people who are uh, poor, uh, nutrition is also behind, so they're not going to have any decent antioxidant defense system. Uh, so when the uh, exposure overwhelms the system, it sets a uh, process of inflammatory cascade and things that you can't uh, imagine, which is responsible for a lot of the uh, damage to the lungs and uh, why some of these young uh, uh, children uh, succumb. Uh, for the Bangladesh uh, project, what we decided we were going to do was look at the frequency of symptoms uh, related to exposure to indoor air pollution, uh, to, I mean, to determine the concentration of some of these heavy metals, because some of these heavy metals are adherent to the uh, particulate matter, you know, and because they're in the respirable uh, portions, uh, 2.5 microgram, it actually get, makes it way down into the uh, airway. We also uh, tried to decide we're going to look at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon in the urine as a biomarker of exposure. Uh, because that would be proof that it's actually gone beyond just inhaling it into the body. And also look at uh, concentration of uh, atoxoguanin, which is a uh, biomarker of uh, uh, oxidative uh, DNA damage. And also try to correlate uh, uh, those biomarkers with exposure. So that was the goal of the uh, Bangladesh uh, project. Uh, here you see the... Uh, this is looking at the uh, concentration of particulate matter in the respirable uh, 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 portion, 2.5 microgram per meter squared, uh, based on the different kinds of biofuels. And you can see that wood, agricultural waste, uh, dung, uh, kerosene, gas, and electricity. The highest, uh, this is about almost 900 uh, microgram per meter squared. And the WHO standard is about 50. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, the kind of exposure that, you know, people get uh, uh, every day in the morning and the afternoon when you're cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And this is uh, just a reflection of uh, symptoms uh, related to the uh, uh, different levels and uh, children. You know, in some of the 192 homes that were surveyed, uh, the level was as high as uh, 1,400 micro, uh, micrograms. So substantial uh, exposure to uh, these toxic uh, pollutants. And uh, the filter from the, um, uh, 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 the uh, equipment that was used to determine the indoor air quality was actually sent and analyzed. And you can see that these are the different uh, uh, trace metals uh, that are adherent to the particulate matter. And I want to bring your attention to iron, the aluminum, uh, nickel, all, of, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so when you have all these go into the lungs with the particulate matter, you can imagine what kind of inflammatory reaction you get in the airway, especially if you don't have good nutrition and excellent antioxidant protection. And then um, uh, looking at um, uh, oxides of uh, nitrogen uh, in that setting, the EPA limit is about 50, but you can see that a lot of the homes had levels that were beyond uh, by the uh, EPA uh, uh, limits. And this is an, uh, an, op an, uh, um, uh, an effort to actually relate the, uh, 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 the PM uh, levels to, uh, uh, to the urinary uh, 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 PAH, okay, for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, which uh, uh, when you look at some of the uh, breakdown products, the one hydroxypyrene, these are actually um, um, are carcinogenic. You can see that there's a good relationship between exposure um, uh, 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 to the biomass and ex uh, biomarker of exposure. This is in the urine. So you see that people are actually getting some of this toxic effect uh, from the exposure. 
And this is again looking at oxidative DNA damage, or oxidative damage, looking this time at uh, 8 oxoguanin. Again, relating it to uh, a biomarker of exposure, you can see that there is a good correlation uh, with that. So, with respect to the Bangladeshi uh, work, uh, clearly uh, biomass uh, use is associated with um, uh, indoor air pollution. Uh, it causes uh, respiratory symptoms just from the sampling. And we have, uh, we've been able to show that uh, uh, trace metals and uh, some of these uh, biomarkers that are carcinogenic actually uh, 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 come with the uh, exposure. With respect to the Nigerian uh, project, what you see here uh, is just uh, an aerial map. I mean, we're getting, there are two uh, rural villages that we use here, and we're trying to be as sophisticated as we can. So we have GPS uh, mapping. We actually, what you see here are individual homes, you know, where we actually went in to look at indoor air quality and some of the work that we do there. Uh, we're trying to, we just acquired our own software, so we won't be using this Google stuff uh, the next time we have to do this. Um, and what we decide, this is just to give you an idea what some of these homes in these rural uh, settings look like. They're just like this. They don't have windows. They don't have set-aside uh, kitchens. They're different shapes. Uh, so people have intimate um, uh, contact with a lot of this um, uh, polluted uh, air. What we decided we were going to look at in the Nigerian project is to, to again, determine the degree of um, indoor pollution from biomass fuel use, uh, the frequency of symptoms uh, related to indoor air pollution, uh, to uh, look at the impact on pulmonary function. I'm a pulmonologist, so we had uh, laptop-based uh, pyrometry in the field, and we, uh, in each of the homes uh, that we actually identified, we had a mother-child pair where we could look at biomarkers, where we also could look at respiratory symptoms and also uh, pulmonary function. And uh, we also introduced um, education into the algorithm because most people don't really, they're not aware of the dangers uh, of uh, the exposure. And um, through the generosity of the uh, Chess Foundation, I had a humanitarian award that gave me money so I could buy a lot of uh, stoves. I gave uh, the stoves to some of the uh, to homes in these uh, uh, communities. So it gave us an opportunity to look at the impact of education and an efficient stove on indoor air quality and some of these biomarkers. So these are ongoing uh, work from the field. And Lenny will be happy here because before we went into the uh, community, what we uh, did was uh, we, we went in there to talk to, to, to the community in terms of community engagement and trying to uh, develop a partnership uh, to let them know what this is all about, what we wanted to do, and uh, the implications for their wives. Uh, and uh, most of the places where we went, uh, they were so alarmed and uh, we'll call, you know, a larger community uh, meeting where we came again and um, talk to them about some of the risk and what we were, of course, we were welcomed uh, into the society. And uh, this, I'm, I'm, pay, I'm spending a little, a few minutes on this because it allows you to actually get into some of these uh, uh, communities. It allows them to be partners in it and it makes uh, for uh, a more robust uh, uh, research work. So that's me there with some of my uh, colleagues uh, talking to the uh, women and the men uh, in this uh, rural uh, community. What we were going to do uh, differently was do a survey um, uh, to uh, try to capture uh, mortality symptoms related to headache, uh, to uh, lung, and all the you know, epidemiologic uh, stuff that we could get. And uh, in the homes that we, uh, and then we went to about 100 homes in this, uh, this is when the early phases of this ongoing work, we uh, went to some of these uh, homes to do indoor air quality mon monitoring, and we had this portable thermoelectron that you know, corrects for uh, humidity and all this stuff. Uh, uh, so we had access to, uh, so we looked at the uh, PM 2.5. We also looked at the carbon monoxide levels uh, in these homes. And then we did um, uh, spirometry. In each home, we identified 
both a mother and a child that's older than six years uh, old. And we also looked at uh, exhaled breath here for nitric oxide as a marker of airway inflammation. Remember, I'm a pulmonary dog. So, so we had this parameter, and then we collected the blood and the urine again uh, to look for some of these uh, biomarkers. And also, because of the uh, poverty, because these are poverty, uh, poor and vulnerable people, we actually also looked at some of the um, markers of nutrition in terms of transferring. We were looking at complement to see whether there was uh, hypocomplementemia. We were looking at SOD. We were looking at lipid peroxidation product. I can't give you the results on all of those today, but we were trying to look at the antioxidant defense system to see whether nutritionally these were people who were behind to, so that we could put all of this uh, uh, in context. And then after the initial phase, uh, we had the education where we actually created brochures translated into the uh, local language with pictures so that people could, uh, uh, could understand you know, how to protect themselves, how not to have the kids around them. And then we gave them the efficient stoves. And then came back three months later uh, to repeat some of this uh, indoor air quality. Um, uh, during that interval, we were just going there to make sure that they didn't have any problems with, uh, with the stoves. Uh, the, in terms of the symptoms from, um, from children, we focused on chest tightness, we focused on headaches, uh, we focused on cough, uh, we focused on uh, runny nose, and we also focused on um, about 40% 40, 40 of the uh, children had cough, about 60% of them had headaches, and uh, 40 per, 20 to 30% had chest tightness. Okay, if you look at uh, the mothers, maybe about 80% of them had headache, uh, about 40% had uh, a cough, and another 30% had uh, chest tightness. If you look at the uh, pre-intervention um, levels of uh, PM 2.5, the mean level in the homes, in the almost 100 homes that we've surveyed, it's about 1,800 micro, microgram per millimeter squared. That's a lot of, uh, that's a, I mean, and the WHO standard, as I mentioned, is about 50. So we're talking about 40-fold uh, in terms of the degree of exposure that people get. When you look at... Uh, carbon monoxide level, that explains why they have a lot of headaches. The carbon monoxide level, they mean, was about 250 parts per million. So in this enclosed uh, space, I don't even know why they don't develop, you know, CO poisoning the way we, maybe because it's intermittent, I wonder what kind of cognitive function, uh, cognitive performance people have because the carbon monoxide level in those enclosed spaces was so high. Uh, but it was striking uh, to see that, uh, because the way I looked at it is it had to be real, because a lot of them had headaches. And the post-intervention uh, level and symptoms actually was very consistent in terms of, you know, decrease in terms of some of the headaches and uh, the level came down precipitously. Um, and in uh, looking at the uh, pulmonary function test, you can see that uh, uh, but this is looking at uh, some of the mothers in one of the villages. Uh, seven of them had normal, 20%. You can see that about 64% uh, or 65%. Oh, all right. 65% had uh, some level of uh, mild obstruction in about 53%, moderate obstruction in about 12% and a restrictive pattern in about uh, 3%. When you look at the children, it's probably the same thing. Almost 60% of them had some element of um, obstructive lung disease. Fast back to uh, where I started with, I was interested in asthma, looking at environment and parasites, and then you overlay indoor pollution from biomass. You can see that uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is a major uh, 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 problem. And this is just uh, uh, to show you what the uh, stove looks like. Uh, and we had this uh, uh, van distributing stoves too. And you know, the people were very, very happy. You can see this is, this is what they look like. And essentially, they're, you know, they're very simple. They're lined with ceramic. 
and uh, it allows them to still use the same fuel, the same dirty fuel, but because the ceramic actually retains a lot of heat, so you have almost near complete combustion because it retains heat and it heats, uh, I mean, the temperature gets so, so high. Um, uh, so this is what it looks like. And initially, five, six years ago, people were charging two, three, four dollars for it. But I paid 21 dollars for each one of this. So, uh, and when you put it in the context of people who live in settings where they don't have a lot of disposable income, this model is not uh, uh, affordable. Although, and this is what it looks like. And you can see that, you know, where they still use the firewood, which is all they can afford. And you don't really see that much. Once you have a startup fuel in there, so even if they're cooking indoors, the, the exposure, the, uh, the, the pollutants that you were getting from the uh, uh, pre-intervention uh, period is not as, uh, not as bad. What is so important uh, in this uh, intervention is that just by giving people efficient stoves without really changing their lives dramatically, without uh, making it unaffordable for them, you can see, I hope I'm able to show you the indoor air quality, and you can see the, uh, uh, in terms of the symptoms, the pre and post uh, intervention. It's just so, uh, so dramatic. And when you look at uh, uh, pre-intervention uh, PM uh, indoor levels, uh, this is uh, WHO limits. And what we did was we, before we, uh, they started uh, cooking, we actually got the ambient level. Okay? And then we monitored uh, the indoor level uh, cycling every 30 seconds. We have one of these uh, Thermo Fisher, you know, very sophisticated instrument that will cycle every 30 seconds. Uh, so after one hour, you could plot anything you wanted. So this is what it looked like in terms of, uh, you can see, almost uh, 1,800. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's really uh, scary. And then this is uh, the CO, carbon monoxide. Parts per million, the ambient level before cooking, nothing. Uh, so you, you could see that it's directly related to, you know, using biomass uh, fuel for, uh, for cooking. I showed you this earlier. And this is what it looks like, you know, post-intervention, just with the education and giving them the efficient stoves. Look, it's about seven, I mean, the average is about 75 to 120. Uh, so if this is directly um, uh, fueling the antioxidant damage, uh, whatever process, uh, inflammatory process that's going on in the lungs, you can see what kind of dramatic change you know, and uh, the potential benefit uh, down, down, down the road. And again, similarly, when you're looking at the uh, carbon monoxide levels, you know, similar, uh, similar uh, uh, outcome when you are through education and with the efficient stoves, uh, you can really improve the uh, indoor, uh, indoor environment. And then this is uh, just coming back three months later, you know, to look at uh, survey, to look at uh, these symptoms, and you can see, you know, pre-intervention and post-intervention that, you know, some of them, and I was so happy to see that a lot of this in the children and also uh, in, the, in, the, in the mothers in the homes. Uh, you know, the particulate matter, especially in the respiratory uh, segment and carbon monoxide, uh, uh, major pollutants from firewood, because these people use exclusively firewood, a little different from the Bangladesh data, where it was a combination of dung, firewood, and all of that. And uh, women and children, uh, you know, are the greatest uh, risk, because they're, those, they're the only people at home exposed uh, and cooking. Uh, it's associated with obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, because both children and mothers, over 60% of them had either mild or moderate obstructive uh, defect on the uh, chest x-ray. I think uh, the distribution of uh, efficient stoves, uh, I see it as an important stopgap measure, uh, but I think the entrepreneurial model where they can actually manufacture this uh, themselves using local materials, uh, th those are efforts that are probably more sustainable than just going around uh, distributing uh, stoves. Uh, clearly, Community engagement and partnership 
you know, before we started was also very, very helpful um, uh, in having them modify, you know, their behavior. And uh, I think uh, when you look at the fact that two, the indoor exposure to indoor air pollution accounts for over almost oh, a little over two million deaths every year, and you're trying to reduce the uh, maternal mortality by uh, 67 percent and infant mortality by 75 percent. If you could eliminate two million deaths of men, and, I mean women and children every year, you'll be will be really ahead in terms of meeting some of these MDG 4 and 5 goals uh, because it kills more than all the other uh, potential causes of uh, uh, mortality. And uh, September last year, I, know, I don't know how many of you caught this uh, announcement by Hillary, um, uh, the uh, Department of State uh, in uh, collaboration with the NIH, they've actually uh, put down about $50 million dollars uh, with um, invitation to some of the Wellcome Trust and some of these other uh, um, uh, non-governmental organizations and foundations to uh, distribute about 100 million stoves globally because, um, th thank God, people are beginning to realize that, you know, 2 million um, preventable deaths every year, I mean, it's a wise uh, investment, but I'm not sure that uh, this is a this is a sustainable model. What I was going to show you was an example of a sustainable model where people were actually using local materials uh, to, uh, uh, to teach uh, the, uh, the people. And you can see that these are uh, happy people, you know. Um, uh, so um, uh, these are some of the uh, folks, um, you know, working with us on the field in Nigeria. These are MPH students in uh, field epidemi epidemiology. Uh, so it's uh, been um, um, uh, a great opportunity to be able to go back, you know, to Africa where people don't usually go to do research uh, because I think um, uh, the potential to, um, you know, understand, um, uh, you know, disease better, look at uh, a cohort of people that are not on too many drugs, you know, done in an ethical uh, manner. I think the opportunity to learn from some of these uh, protected areas is just uh, tremendous. And I just want to thank some of the uh, collaborators um, and the Falk Medical Trust and Chess Foundation that have uh, supported uh, uh, this work. I'll stop and take um, any questions that you may have. Um, why was there such a high frequency of cooking inside pre-intervention? What do you mean by? Um, it's, you mentioned that most of the mothers were cooking indoors and that yes. this was part of the problem, but if a lot of them started cooking outso outside post-intervention, why weren't they doing that to begin with? No, they actually, I mean, the post-intervention stuff was done inside, you know, with the efficient stove, the same condition. We were interested in making sure that we could uh, um, uh, demonstrate that the efficient stove was actually doing what it was supposed to do. So the post-intervention monitoring was also done indoors uh, with the use of efficient stoves and the same firewood that they, would, they can afford. But she was asking, I think, why they cook inside rather than outside? We, because, I mean, that's where they cook. I mean, I don't know, most of you have not seen, I mean, Sometimes, I mean, in these places, uh, they, I mean, if you look at the Maasai Mambo, the way they construct the homes, uh, they don't have windows. You know, the Maasai are a good tribe because, you know, they live right there in the Serengeti with the lions. And, uh, you know, if you, in fact, they, they have a little place inside the Maasai Mambo where they keep their goats. The little ones, they put inside. The big ones, because by the morning, you know, the hyena or the, you know, they would have taken the little goats. So they live inside with their goats. There are no windows. So, and they cook inside. And sometimes when it's cold, you know, it's another way of generating heat. So that's a way of life. Do other societies at this level of income have histories of designing homes that don't have the same problems? 
is it is it the large animals that are there that's the fundamental? I mean, it's actually just interesting. Yeah. Why? You know, <laughs> he, he, historically, people have used firewood to cook. You know, when I was uh, growing up, you know, I didn't. I mean, it's not in the rural area, even in the city. When you want to have big parties, they bring out those big stoves. They use firewood to really cook the large when you have, uh, but. But most people don't, I mean, I mean even, that's even in the, in the urban centers when you have access to um, the liquefied gas and all that. But when you have to feed a hole, that's when people bring out the big stoves and the firewood. But a lot of these uh, poor people, um, that's, that's what they do. That's what they've done historically. They don't understand the impact. You know, I have a lot more pictures. I have some of, pictures of some of these Teenagers, uh, you know, sometimes they have a little business where they were doing uh, cooking outside. Femi, you remember? You know, I walked in there. I couldn't stay there for more than five minutes. My eyes were just, here was this teenager. That's, that's her job. When she comes back, she sits down there the whole day, just staring the big, um, you know, walking for mom. So I don't know whether over time, you know, they get desensitized. But it's also interesting that people who have exposure to indoor air pollution at this level. They actually have a higher incidence of cataract. They have higher incidence of intrauterine growth retardation because it's just like smoking. So there's more and more and more health effects related to this. It's out of, I mean, I don't know whether you want to call it ignorance or they just don't have a choice. I thought David might say something about cost effectiveness analysis in, uh, yeah. in this. I mean, what strikes me is that the uh, quality adjusted life years per uh, investment are ex it's extraordinarily low cost compared to I mean you, you, compared to what we obviously spend most of our time doing in medicine in in our world and and I just wondered if you have any commentary about that uh, with respect to sort of global healthcare ethics. Yeah, you know this. I mean that's actually part of the excitement that I get um, with doing this kind of work. Uh, because, um, you know, this kills more than HIV, malaria, and it's totally preventable. Um, I think the idea, the, I mean, the, the, the fact that more and more people are aware that indoor pollution kills so many. Uh, when I was telling you, Mark, you remember, we sat over dinner about a year ago, and I was telling Mark, Mark, I don't think he believed me <laughs> until <laughs> he didn't believe me completely. And then when uh, Hillary Clinton announced, he was looking for me and said, Chola, I think you're right, you know? <laughs> so most people really can't imagine that, you know, you have something like that killing so many people and nothing's been done over time. But it's a reflection of people who don't have a voice. You know, these are poor people who don't have access to electricity. All they have is access to whatever they can scavenge, and uh, that's, that's all they have. Uh, so in terms of the uh, uh, return of investment, when you look at uh, the disability, I just, I mean, this is a huge one. And that's why I think the sustainable model of teaching people how to use local materials to actually create the efficient stoves themselves is uh, a more sustainable model because uh, uh, you know, the efficient stoves, when they first started with the ceramic, they were 2 or $3. The ones that I uh, distributed, it was up to, you know, $20. Uh, that's more than people make in a year, you know, in those settings. So I think, um, yeah, it would be nice for, to be able to invest uh, uh, in training. And there's another model in Haiti. One of our students, one of uh, our TED students here, um, uh, Art Spark, uh, they've created an uh, entrepreneurial uh, system model around uh, energy use in Haiti uh, to the degree that people are now, they're using uh, all kinds of sheet metal anywhere they can find it, old car doors, you know, they've, no, they've figured out to create these efficient stoves out of, the, out of uh, local materials that would otherwise be uh, thrown away. I was going to ask if you uh, considered um, any model where you would have the people in the intervention pay uh, a subsidized rate for their stoves, um, because you mentioned the $20 million that the State Department is investing, but that's not going to buy stoves for 3 billion people. Mm -hmm. 
So I was just wondering if you had any sort of model of like having people pay something for the stove or do you know what I mean? Yeah, in, fa in fact, that's what I, uh, I mean, again, uh, this uh, pilot study was to try and understand the, the mechan we we're interested in the science of it. How does it do this? Uh, because you have to understand that in a lot of these uh, countries uh, where they even have access to all the all kinds of um, cleaner fuel, people who are marginalized can't afford it. If I had a wish, I would just say, well, why don't we just have a rural electrification program? That will wipe away uh, a lot of this. But that's asking for a lot because a lot of these dictators, you know, they don't see the the poverty among their people. They live big. Uh, so we're going to still see a lot of people, in fact, more people using biomass fuel for decades to come. Uh, but an entrepreneurial model uh, similar to the one that uh, is being, uh, that's been conducted in Haiti, that's actually uh, the way it works. You know, they make people buy it, and you look at your costs, um, uh, energy cost and uh, using the uh, cleanup fuel once you have the acquisition cost you you realize that you you know you are saving money at the end of the day to acquire the uh, efficient stoves and then people are actually now making them and then you know making money out of it uh, so I think that's a model that I believe is uh, sustainable we're also from the uh, scientific aspect interested in um, augmentation, nutritional augmentation, because, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the SOD, um, uh, the lipid peroxidation, the albumin, the pre-albumin, I mean, nutritionally, these are just a mess. I, I, I didn't want to bog you with uh, too much uh, details, but when you have no antioxidant defense system and you're being exposed to such a high load of pollutants, you can understand how the antioxidant defense system can be overwhelmed. So I think something as simple as, you know, playing around with uh, the nutrition in that area can actually also improve the uh, antioxidant defense system. And I think uh, Habib has also done that with uh, people who are exposed to arsenic. You know, you give them selenium and there's more methylation and um, a breakdown of the selenium, I mean, of the um, arsenic. Uh, and you have, uh, uh, so there's a model for you know, augmenting the antioxidant defense system as a way of mitigating the effect of the exposure to the biomass uh, and indoor pollution. Does the fact that the stove is more efficient <clears throat> also mean that people use less fuel and therefore have to spend less effort obtaining fuel and also perhaps cutting down fewer forests in order to get the fuel that they need? Thank you for bringing that perspective if I failed uh, to uh, bring it up. But you know, usually it's the young children after school who have to go out and look for wood and agricultural residue. So the efficiency means that people are, cool, uh, are cooking with less need for firewood. Uh, there's less degradation to the uh, environment. And the kids actually have a little more time to do their homework. Uh, so when you look at it, and then, you know, they don't die. Uh, you know, so it's a win-win. It's, it's really a win-win situation. <laughs> it's a win-win, really. Uh, I, I think this, yeah. this was a fabulous way to end yeah. the, uh, this was a fabulous way to end the uh, winter quarter uh, on a very exciting, uh, very high note uh, of, of not only the, the extent of, of a problem that as, as Shola says, a year ago, I sure wasn't aware of when, when Shola told me about it for the first time, but also the, 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 potential, the potential of developing global solutions that, I mean, could save enormous numbers of lives um, and contribute to improving quality of life uh, throughout the world. Shola, uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you.